Hey, everybody. Sorry, we're um, one minute late. That's my fault. <laughs> so anyway, you guys are in for a treat. We're going to uh, talk about, yeah, we still got some more stories. And I'm really disappointed, Jack, you don't have the themed graphic behind you. I'm really disappointed. You're, I guess you're having to represent for, for Shoemaker because of all the time you spent. 96 weeks. I misspoke last week. I said 93rd, but it was actually the 95th week. <laughs> so we're coming up on our 100th, 100th week anniversary, and um, we got something really special <laughs> in, for, in store for you. You guys know the drill. Hit us up on uh, the chat if you want to harass us. Q&A. We'd love to do real-time Q&A so it's not just you know, a bunch of talking heads, but we will talk about m a war stories, and in particular, kind of the things to look for, things that you should be doing now if exiting or transitioning to somebody internally, et cetera, is, is a thought or a dream or an impending thing. <laughs> it's, it's still, it, it may not be too late to start, but the earlier, the better. And, and we can talk about that. So um, Adam, do you have any um, thoughts? We'll kick it to you first, and then we'll move over to Jack. Yeah, um, I don't have anything on, um, you know, kind of stimulus or the tax front, because, uh, you know, I think we talked about last week that I think it's going to be all hands on deck associated with Supreme Court nominee, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I just don't see a lot happening um, on that front um, before the um, midterm election front. So I think, again, we're probably safe on taxes, but at the same time, probably not going to see any new stimulus. I'm just going to keep on repeating that, though, since I still get asked the question, which isn't bad. I appreciate people asking questions, but that's, that's the answer and we're sticking to it. But um, in terms of M&A, you know, I think one of the stories that I wanted to share, you know, before we kind of riff off each other and get into deeper topics or see what the Q&A is, is that the, um, you know, literally this just happened this morning. So it's top of mind, <laughs> you know, based on a conversation um, yesterday afternoon. And, and it's really based on the fact that, you know, for most of our clients, they're only going to sell their business once, you know, maybe twice. So it's not second nature to them to, to know how they're going to get screwed. <laughs> um, and, 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 and the screwing isn't intentional. I mean, maybe in some cases it is intentional, but in most cases it's unintentional. So in this case, you know, the, the seller, you know, is getting arguably what he thinks is going to be a pretty good deal. It's an, it, you know, it's an 11 times EBITDA multiple, which is really freaking good to get an 11 times EBITDA multiple. Um, but, but that's all he knows right now. Um, so what he does know is that there's going to have to be, you know, he's only selling 70% of the company. It's not 100% sale. So he's going to be part of, um, he's going he's gonna to own a piece of the action going forward. But they're, you know, so far, they haven't, the, the buying party has not answered the question like, okay, cool. Well, if we make a million bucks next year, own 70-30, where's the cash go? <laughs> You know, like, do I get the cash or is it going to be used to pay the debt that you guys used to buy me? Like, what am I even going to get a tax distribution? <laughs> you know, it, is, is the holding company even going to be a C-Corp? Like what, you know, silent, you know, which, which, you know, if it was a partnership not making tax distributions that I own 30% of that makes a million dollars a year, that kind of fundamentally changes my evaluation of the deal. Um so, so far, silent on the discussions. Also silent, you know, this guy has been one of the best listeners that we've ever had in our client base in terms of following our advice. Um, so he's taken a very tax efficient salary that passes the IRS smell test for what he needs to take, but is not as market value for running, you know, a $50 million organization for a private equity firm, you know, that, that, that's a, that's hundreds of thousands of year dollar a year job with bonus incentives that this guy has not taken in his W2. I mean, he makes a lot, but that's not what he's taken in his W2. So also silent is okay, cool. Well, how am I going to get paid for running this thing for the next five years? 
you know, mm. and related to that, especially if I'm not getting distributions off my 30%. And then related to that is that, you know, what, what's another one of Jack and I's favorites? Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, now we'll totally pay you a salary. We'll send you over an employment contract that has no term on it. A non-compete that basically says, if you get a job at Chick-fil-A, we're going to sue your ass. <laughs> um, and by the way, we can fire you for any reason with no notice and no severance. <laughs> so, you know, the, the, the next thing you got to hammer out is, well, cool. I'm, I'm going to be running this thing for the next five years. But like, what are those terms? Like, can you fire me? You know, if so what are the terms? What happens to my 30% if you do fire me? So this is all, I'm, I'm only bringing this up because, you know, a lot of this stuff, like the initial LOI, if you get one and you haven't looped the guy like Jack and me in it, you know, your LOI is probably going to be silent on these terms. But yet, you know, when you start asking questions about them, all of a sudden, you know, here's what's going to happen. You know, the buyer is going to get all butt hurt and say, oh, I thought we had a deal. <laughs> and kind of your perspective as a seller is, yeah, and I thought that you were going to treat me fairly. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, my counsel to him, which is the same counsel to anybody that's on the, on the call, is like, look, dude, price is not everything. <laughs> that's just one aspect. You know, how you're getting paid, what you're going to own, what are the terms of your employment? All of this stuff is important and needs to be hammered on, like, ideally, before there even is an LOI <laughs> so that it's not a surprise and nobody's shocked because these, like, if I just think about that plus working capital, why do deals blow up? Those are the reasons, you know, so just get them out, you know, get them out early. That's my opening tirade, Gary. Oh man, that was a good one. I like that. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's very specific and very real time. Oh, Jack, dude, just for you, dude. <laughs> Yeah, I like to, I, I don't like to let people down. And since you called me out on it, I was like, OK, I'll fix it. So there you go. <laughs> so um, in, in following up to to Adam's comment about LOIs, and, and we really could do an entire session on the anatomy of LOI and of asset purchase agreements and of stock purchase agreements. But um, interestingly, yesterday was the annual North Carolina Bar Association business law section meeting combined with a CLE. Uh, it was all uh, virtual, but they did talk about one of the one of the cases. There's an annual case law update, and they talked about uh, LOIs. And in a case in particular, that uh, there was involved in an LOI, and whether or not you could first of all, what what were the binding and non-binding provisions, and can you bring a document that is not part of the LOI into the fold of things? And it was a document that was part of the negotiations. It was an email back and forth, but it demonstrated the party's intent. Now, remember, LOIs are supposed to be uh, non-binding, but it demonstrated the party's intent. And then the deal was changed, essentially, and there was a claim of bad faith that the seller was getting cold feet. And so the issue became, can you bring this extraneous information into the fold of things into what a document that is non-binding, essentially? And the answer, well, the, there was not an answer. It was sent back down to the trial court for uh, um, uh, reconsideration. But the um, originally it was that, no, it cannot because it's non-binding. But the, the appeal court sent it back down to say, well, you know, what was it? part of the inducement of entering into the LOI based on the information back and forth and, and negotiations with each other. So to Adam's point, having your stuff together and having the deal essentially at least the substantive terms done, because that's really what the LOI is for, is to make sure that the parties are not worlds apart on some of the most important issues. And a lot of times, as Adam said, some of those things are just missed and it's not purposeful. It's not meant to be deceitful or fraudulent that, hell, oh, let's not talk about it in the document so that way we can deal with it and it, not talk about it in the LOI so we can deal with it in the transaction document. But it is just, okay, we just didn't think about it. And then there was a not a meeting of the minds on a, a particular very important issue. And then you're arguing about it. And then there's mud being flung as to, well, you sh if that's what you really wanted, you should have put it in the document. Well, we all thought that we were, that's what we were going to do. Cause isn't that what people normally do in these transactions? So you get into all of that stuff. So 
Um, uh, a side note, Carrie, I still owe you a, a Starbucks card. I just remembered that when I pulled my notes from last week. So I will get that out to you. Um, and then if we want to go ahead and start talking about kind of what we wanted to start talking about and kind of go into that or um, do you want to answer some questions or where do you want to go, Gary? Yeah, let, um, Robert Mayetta, early bird gets the worm. So he get, he got the first question in, a statement and then a question. <laughs> so let's deal with that and then let's go uh, keep going into, um, you know, what to look for, what to not, to, what to avoid. Uh, oh man, so <laughs> Robert, <laughs> Get your hand off that button. <laughs> yeah, you, you <laughs> so kind of can. I, well, I think, geez, I don't know, Robert. Who would we recommend? Survival CFO, Robert. No, seriously, Robert is doing a great job um, for several <laughs> of our clients right now. So I do appreciate that, that um, financials are definitely a big part of the due diligence process. But yeah, his question was really, um, let's not forget about the potential economic development benefits that might be available when expanding into a new county. Um, that should be part of the research. Yeah, you know, kind of when I think about economic incentives, you know, period, or tax, you know, incentives, period, with a business when entering a new market, acquiring a company or whatever, I mean, you know, the first thing that I look at is, all right, is the business a good deal or not? You know, kind of period. If there were no incentives, would the business still be a good deal? And if it passes the basic test, then the economic incentives are just an added bonus to me to, to make it happen. Like if it passes the economic smell test of like, hey, it's a good transaction regardless, um, then, then I still want to go through with it because the, the economic incentive just kind of juices up the return that I'm going to get. Where, I, where I'm a little bit more cautious is when you're having to, to use an economic incentive to make the deal work, meaning like, hey, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't going to meet our investment criteria, but because we got this economic incentive, you know, now now it does. And the reason for that is that, you know, economic incentives can come and go. I mean, you know, you could you could bet on something, and then depending on how the incentive is written, you know, the, the government could could take it away. And also, you know, it usually means that look, if the if the deal was kind of on the borderline, there's probably an underlying wart there somewhere you know, that exists. So, you know, I, I generally tell people, you know, we definitely want to go after the economic incentives that may, may be available to you. Um, but don't, don't do that for a bad deal. Like a good one, an easy one right now that's out there is investing in a qualified opportunity zone, which is basically a distressed area. It could be a business, could be a piece of real estate. Don't got to pay taxes on it. Not paying taxes is pretty darn cool because that means that, you basically increase the return by, you know, 25% or whatever, you know, based on whatever the capital gains rate is at the time. But if otherwise, that's a crappy ass deal. And the only reason I'm even getting to like a marginal return, <laughs> in other words, like if it's a 5% return, but geez, because of the tax incentive, it gets me to a 30% return. Oh my gosh, it's great. It's like, I don't know, man, because that sounds like it was pretty crappy at the 5% return. I mean, I much rather would be I much rather would have something that's like a 15% return, but then the tax incentive, you know, takes it to 40, you know, percent, not, not, not the other, not, not a bad deal that I'm trying to shine up, you know, with, with some sort of incentive. And I would add the comment that uh, with respect to economic incentives, I think there's a misconception as to who it's for, who it's available to, in that it's not, reserved for the behemoth companies that want to build a mega manufacturing facility somewhere in Charlotte or the surrounding counties. There's money out there and money is money uh, in, in to bring those jobs. And there very much is a goal and incentive and uh, you know, everything else by private and public uh, officials to bring resources, companies, and people to this region to continue to grow it. So it's not reserved for the elite or the, the large companies only. So um, you need to keep that in mind. And, and a good resource that I, and because I've been a part of the Charlotte Chamber, which is now the Charlotte Regional Business Alliances, uh, part, part of their mandate when they combined the, um, the, the um, Charlotte Regional 
organization with the Charlotte Chamber to create the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance was to better facilitate growth in the region because it was more like a competition. You had like center city and then you had the other regions and you had councils and you, but it was okay. Well, pitting Cabarrus County against, uh, you know, even like Rock Hill, South Carolina, and there's North Carolina, South Carolina issues as well, competition, but so, you know, Gastonia versus Cabarrus, let's say, and trying to unify that and, and put companies in the right places for their growth uh, and the type of industries, et cetera. So you always be on, if that's something that is on your radar and on your wish list, that that is available and it's not, it, it's available to us ordinary people, essentially. Yeah, good point. And if anybody is actually contemplating building a building, adding new employees, and, you know, it, and it's not out there yet, but you're thinking about it, that's when you want to, enlist somebody like a Zach Kimball uh, or there are other folks that focus on incentives and not just tax incentives, but there are other incentives available out there. Um, and we can connect you to some of those people. But uh, Robert did make the point during the due diligence process, a key component is to ensure that the financials are in good order. A yes and amen. And I don't know, do you know any fractional CFOs that you could serve is that function, Adam? You know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe survival yeah. CFO. <laughs> yeah, Robert. We do recommend yeah. him. <laughs> yeah, good job. Hey, he's here every week, so he deserves some props. So. I agree. I think he should get a Starbucks card for like he's like the most loyal of all the fractional CFOs that we know, and we know some really good ones, and he's one of those good ones. But I think he should get one of your Starbucks gift cards. <laughs> here I am giving away your money. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'll add them to the list. I'll, uh, Carrie, I'll send you one, as I said. And I'll, all right, fine. Robert, I'll send you one too. Oh, man. Good job, Robert. <laughs> all right. Let's 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 keep going. Yeah. Okay. What are we looking for? Well, so the other the other one that I think we wanted to hit on that we, we touched on a little bit last week, Gary, is the concept of an earnout. Um you know, and kind of where, what to look for and where those goes bad. So just first off, you know, kind of some basic terminology is that, you know, anytime you've got a purchase price difference, meaning, you know, Gary wants $200 and I, I only think it's worth 150. Gary's like, no, 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 it's worth 200. Um, you know, the way that I bridge that fifty thousand dollar gap is I tip or fifty dollar gap is I tip, I try to use small numbers, but the way I bridge the gap is I would go to Gary and say that's fine, and if it does as well as you say that it's going to do, I don't mind paying you the extra fifty dollars. So the reason that earnouts occur, you know, are typically because you know a buyer while a buyer is buying on the possibility of future cash flow, like all your story, you know, about how, oh, you've got all the sun tap potential in your customer base, <laughs> you know, oh, geez, you know, sales pipelines never been stronger than it is this year. <laughs> you know, oh, we had a banner year this last year up 25%, even though every year prior we've only been up 5%. You know, it's like, is a buyer like, I don't know if you're full of shit or not. <laughs> you know, all I've got, sorry about the language there, all I've got are your historic financial statements. Um, to, to, to make my analysis. So, you know, I want to believe you um, because if I believe you, then that's probably going to work out for me. It's just that I'm not willing to pay for that, you know, and be on the hook for it um, in, in a, in a, in an absolute obligation. So I'm willing to use an earnout um, to, br to bridge the gap. Um, I think, you know, where we find that earnouts create problems again is when their last minute deal changes. <laughs> um, so I think we, we touched on it, you know, in, in the last call, but, you know, kind of the, the worst examples that we've seen, I mean, I've, we've had several deals that this has happened on is that, you know, negotiate the price, negotiate the term, you know, this much cash, you know, this much rollover equity. And at the last minute, well, you know, 
we found something in diligence. So we want to change that's kind of immaterial, but they view it as material. So we want to change this to be more of an earnout, you know, less cash up front, you know, or the earnout is based on, you know, an unrealistic target that, you know, you couldn't hit on your best day. <laughs> um, or it's based on, you know, a target, but it's stuff you're not in control in, like, you know, hey, Gary, um, you know, totally believe you, sales pipeline's better, you know, than, than ever anticipated, and, you know, we're totally going to pay you an earnout, and that's going to be great, and then on day two, by the way, um, we're going to have to eliminate the marketing budget, eliminate the sales budget, we're going to have to change the sales commission structure, too, because, you know, we're way overpaying your sales guys, you know, it's like, what am I supposed to do with that? You know, at that point. So I think I think the 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 kind of lesson that we've learned is that if you're signing up for an earnout, make sure that you are down to like an earnout that is very much in your control. You know, not in someone else's control. And if I could add to that a, a tangential, because I'm going through this now. And I apologize in advance to our investment banker and broker friends out there that are negotiating engagement letters with uh, their prospect clients, but uh, who happen to be my clients as well, is that um, what, is, what is the commission or the fee on a sale transaction? And you know, it, sometimes it's called aggregate value, sometimes it's called aggregate consideration, whatever it may be. And the obvious is either a set number or a set number, and then if it exceeds a certain a sales price number, then there's a certain percentage. Maybe it's a percentage across the board. But then you get into uh, the the deferred compensation, essentially like an earnout. And what should that broker get as a part of that? Well, because it is contingent consideration, you would think that okay, well, sure, well the broker will get paid when the broker gets paid. But if you read some of these engagement letters carefully, it will say that the, the aggregate consideration that their fee is measured against is the total consideration, including the present value of any consideration that is paid out later, potentially. And they basically putting the risk on the seller that uh, there may be less consideration there, so the broker, but the broker still gets paid on the full consideration, which from the broker's perspective, perspective makes sense. It's okay. I brokered this deal and you have the potential of getting this. And if you don't get a hundred percent of that earnout, whose fault is it? Not me, the broker, it's you, the seller. So why should I, why should I walk that walk with you for that one year period or whatever it is? So you know, just be aware of those, the, those engagement letters need to be read very carefully and put through the what ifs, this, 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 and this. And sometimes the, the because that's so early on, the concept of an earnout, or even, uh, and, and I had to split a hair between a, um, a, a, a basket essentially of a indemnity uh, that was set up a, a, an escrow essentially, post uh, closing escrow. Those escrows uh, essentially serve two purposes. One is to provide insurance for the indemnities that are in the agreement so that the buyer can go against the, um, or, or so that the buyer can go against the, the, the seller can go against the buyer, sorry, for things that happen, right? And get some of that money back potentially uh, if there are issues or vice versa, it depends on what the escrow is. But also it can be used as a purchase price adjustment. So if you have a networking capital adjustment and it is, well, okay, we're gonna ding the escrow for those, the true up 60 days after closing. Okay. So I've had to split that hair, essentially say, okay, um, the value at the end of the day, if there's a deduct for bad behavior, then you should still get your commission on the full value as if you had received that. If it's a purchase price deduct, you're supposed to get a part of the purchase price. So if it's a, if it's a, an adjustment, then you shouldn't get the benefit of that. That's another subtlety that can cost tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars potentially in a transaction. So I bring that up only because that's fresh in my mind of having negotiated this in the past 24 hours.
Oh, you're on mute, Gary. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Here's a question for you. And uh, Robert actually kind of teed it up nicely and we didn't coordinate that. But uh, besides hiring Robert Mayetta with, uh, with uh, Survival CFO or a fractional CFO, that's good to help you make sure that your books are clean and tidy in order, et cetera. What are some other things that you guys would recommend that somebody, a business owner that's thinking about it, what can they do now? Ideally, five years out from a transaction, but even if they had a shorter time frame, like what should they be doing now? I have a whole list of things. So, uh, but Adam, you can go first if you, and I'll just kind of supplement what you say and we'll just go through the list. Yeah. Do, do Jack's list. (laughs) (laughs) That's fine. Yeah. Yeah, Uh No, I think, I mean, obviously, you know, making sure that your financial process is bulletproof because like, you know, crappy books, you know, that that's seriously, that's the biggest value detractor on the planet because that's like, that's the only thing that you can truly rely on is the data. And it's like, the data is garbage. It's like, ugh, you know, I'm kind of taking a guess or it's like, like that, that, that problem, you know, if I, if I was to place an, a, a value on it, that alone probably is at a minimum one times EBITDA in terms of a value destroyer. And I, and I could probably make the case, it's probably more like two or three. So if you just take your EBITDA times one, two or three, that's how much it costs you by having to have crappy books when the time comes. So all the people are like, ah, yeah, counting, counting so expensive. I want to, I want to save, you know, it's my sister doing it and I'm, you know, kind of some, so whatever it is it's like, <laughs> okay, well, I mean, your, your decision to not spend, you know, 50 grand, 60 grand, 70 grand just cost you a million five. I hope you're okay with that. I mean, that sounds like the jerk way to say it, but that, that's the truth. Um, so that, that's, that is very important, but independent of that, you know, kind of, kind of getting buttoned up on your risk areas, you know, like, um, customer concentration, you know, make, making sure that nobody accounts for greater than 25%. You know, or or at least you got a good story behind it. Um, you know, making sure that your key people are buttoned up in terms of employment agreements, non compete stuff like that. I mean, you basically just, you know, you kind of what you want to do is you want to make it real easy to make the thing turnkey, um, which, which really comes down to, you know, solid track record of growth and reduction of risk in the business are kind of the two big, two big themes outside of just making sure your financial house is in order. All right. You guys ready to go to class? I made a list. I made a list because I didn't want to forget anything. And, and definitely the things that Adam just mentioned are on there. And I, I agree that. So I, I kind of look at this in, in maybe three buckets, just generally speaking. So you have the introspective aspects. So look within the company and see what's going on. Then I think you have kind of the financial aspects, which is related. And then you have in the third bucket, the other stuff, which is things like, and we'll talk about that, um, you know, as far as like reputation, goodwill, things like that. So from within, you you start looking at what, how, how is the entity managed? So is it a management team? Is it a good management team? Is it an owner that's kind of doing everything uh, is it an owner that's trying to do everything. Is it an owner that, uh, and we mentioned this before, that is in the back office doing the accounting when he or she should be out there in the streets doing the business development. And that's how the business started. And that's how it was successful. But at some point that person got pulled into the office and got tethered to the chair and in front of a computer. The um, Adam had mentioned the systems and processes. So you think about, okay, the, uh, and we talked about the financial processes. So have uh, your back office and your financial and your financial records uh, in order. It's, it is, and I see this all the time it, when we go in and we do due diligence um, on behalf of a buyer or we're helping a seller prepare for due diligence. And I basically give them the list that I would ask a buyer, buyer's counsel to start doing and start populating electronic 
virtual data room, you know, and and so uh, you know, how how well are they prepared to fill in those electronic folders with information and data, and then you talk about internally the actual production of the goods or services and how how that is um, modernized. So, for example, the in the food service. The, uh, fat, the quick serve, those that were able to 18, 24 months ago, pivot into a um, hands-free, hands-off delivery pickup mode and really shut down their, the lights literally and figuratively were the ones that survived. How do you make that run efficient, efficiently? Well, you have to have kind of a good app uh, to do that and for people to be able to order. And so things like that. So what what have, or are you kind of still stark, stuck in the, the dark ages of business? Uh, and now I can kind of say pre-COVID essentially, because really COVID is, I think, Jack theory, a benchmark as to the next generation or what you need to do in, in certain businesses and industries. Uh, and if you don't do those things, then you're going to be left behind. You're going to be you know, the blockbuster video of, um, you know, your industry. So on the money side of things, what is your, what, what does your revenue stream look like? Is it recurring? Is it, you know, is it, uh, yes, an annuity, essentially, you have a contract with, and, and you're the best game in town, you know, so what can you show that is going to continue in the future? Um, multiple streams of revenue. So diversity of customers, the, the, are you relying upon one customer or, uh, you know, can you, if something happens to one, can you pivot to, to others or have the capacity to very quickly pivot if you needed to? You may be okay with being not as diverse in your customer base. So, and equally important is your diversity of supply. I mean, we've all seen what supply chain issues can issues that supply chain disruptions can create. So you need to, you know, have your next best option essentially ready to go, uh, potentially. And a, a lot of people, a lot of businesses learn that lesson the hard way by not being prepared. And then when you come knocking on the door of that alternative source, it's, well, you know, we have to service our own customers that have been loyal to us or wish you had told us earlier, or come to us earlier, because we're basically at our capacity to be able to produce whatever it is. So you need to be careful with that. Um, and then relatedly kind of sus sustainability of earnings. So all those things kind of put together that demonstrate that that revenue stream is gonna continue down the road. And then kind of the third bucket, which is like the other bucket. Um, and I talked about, uh, briefly mentioned reputation in the community. Uh, I think these days with social media, it's very easy to have a reputation wrecked, but it's also very easy, easier to build up that goodwill and reputation. So, um, you know, as a consumer, unfortunately, I was one of those people that had issues with uh, HVAC and um, what I do, I went into next door and looked, found a service provider in my area that had like 132 little hearts. And that was the first person that I called because the person that, that had done work for me is no longer in business. So um, retired. Uh, and so, you know, you, you use those platforms and use social media to build up. And so as buyer's counsel, I look into those things, like what efforts have been done to get out there and build a reputation. Things like search engine optimization, Tell me about your website. Tell me, you know, you have a vendor. Are you doing this? Well, you know, it's, and, and what's telling is you go to someone's website and it still has the copyright from 2019 on it, which means no one has touched it for three years. Uh, and, and it may be that, okay, no one has changed that, low, you know, the copyright and has been worked on, but you would think that as you're going through that, you're like, oh, I guess I need to change that to 2021 or 2022. Um, so, something that comes up is ownership of intellectual property. When you as a manufacturer or you're in the stream of commerce and you have other people as part of that supply chain, let's say you have stuff being made in China or elsewhere, 
Now, this is this is difficult. I mean, it's easier to talk about than it is to kind of um, because you have to rely upon other people. But when there is, for example, a technology that is maybe related to a patent that my client holds, I want to make sure that my client owns every aspect of the construction of that, whatever it is. And it could be that, well, you know, this component comes from here and this component comes from there. Okay. Do you have exclusivity with the supplier of that component? Do you have um, the pro appropriate intellectual property rights? If it was a work for hire, so you hired someone and they hired someone, is there a, an agreement that says that it's a work for hire, work for hire, work for hire, ultimately back to you as the chain of ownership? Uh, and, and, a lot of times, okay, you just got to take a leap of faith and it's just not uh, financially or, or, or efficient within a deal to go through that due diligence. But there have been times for some of my technology companies that that's, that's very important. They don't want to find out that some guy in France owns uh, part of the intellectual property, the, the process that we thought we owned the patent for and is saying, well, yeah, you have the patent, but steps nine and 10 are really mine and, and the company who produced that for you and transferred the patent to you as the seller knew that. And so, yeah, sorry, start sending me my check for your sales of using my technology that I developed. So there's things like that. And then one interesting one is uh, a lot, a lot of business owners will um, have the business expenses in the books of, automobiles, um, Panthers tickets, those kind of things, legitimate business expenses, but kind of in your, they're more on the personal side of things. So you, know, you need to, uh, I think, go into a transaction and understanding where those kind of soft expenses are that um, might be to your benefit to say, okay, well, in, a, in an arm's length transaction, you would choose whether or not to, to have those expenses. So really those expenses come off the book, which then increases the, the net value of the company potentially. Um, but um, so generally speaking, then back to the financials is don't, if there's something that you should be able to explain every aspect of your financials. Um, and you should, as a buyer, be asking every aspect of the financials. You see something on there, you ask. And that seller better be able to explain why there is a note payable to a related company, to an affiliate and explain why that is. Well, you know, what, for whatever reason. So those are just some things that, you know, kind of popped in my head as I was thinking about uh, this stuff, but it, what it ultimately runs down to is uh, in the due diligence, whether it's financial or anything else, uh, your story as a seller has to withstand that process. And, uh, if, if there's something that you say, well, I, I'll explain that later, or I'll figure it out later, later comes very fast. So don't wait. Uh, and, and the thing is, and we've said this before, is that even if you're not in a transact, a sale transaction or a purchase transaction process now, that the things that you would do in preparation for that is going to make you a better company. Is going to make you an efficient company. I've had companies that have clients that have gone through this, and the sale has not occurred. But they're like, "Oh my gosh, we are running. Our, you know, our revenue, gross revenue, has increased, and our net revenue has increased because we've reduced, uh, um, you know, just fluff and reduced expenses, become more efficient. We've embraced technology, whatever it is. So it's it's a good way of kicking the tires of your own company." even if you're not on the selling block. Yeah, that's some good stuff right there, man. I mean, if that just came off the top of your head, you ought to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pretend to be one every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, those are some really good things. You know, I, I know of a couple clients of ours that have, uh, first of all, you know, I, I, I've seen concentration risk on clients a lot um, that have always been issues in deals, but the supply chain diversification and concentration risk, um, I mean, honestly, I, I don't, 
remember any other deals that we saw that we actually really worried about that. And, you know, um, but it's become a real issue front and center. And um, a friend of mine who has a, a specialized concrete company, <clears throat> uh, they have to have a very specialized engineer work on their projects and they had concentration risk in that one engineer and and it was causing some real issues um and um so they've diversified and he's not looking to sell he's continuing to grow that thing really well but i mean that was putting a lot of constraints and pressure on big clients of theirs that um i mean that's a real risk so i'm glad you brought that up um but some of our clients, I have a couple in particular that within the next three or four months, you know, people have been dangling carrots in front of them, this and that. I mean, this is not a five-year runway, which this is not the ideal thing. You know, it's like, okay, what besides making sure, all right, get those that financial house in order. I mean, this is kind of like at the nth hour, are there any things things that you can do or they should do to make sure that they're buttoning things up as much as they can to improve their their margins or you know their sale price i was on mute there i i think that so yeah i think we get you know Jack's point about, you know, kind of going through the checklist and getting buttoned up, you know, well in advance is good. I think as long as you're showing forward momentum on at least knowing where your challenges are and kind of putting plans in place to address them, you know, like if you have, if you've got a margin issue and you kind of know it, like owning it, you know, hey, we know we've got a margin issue. Here's what we're doing about it. You know, we've got a margin issue. It's related to one contract. <laughs> you know, and that contract will be done. However, if you look at the track record of our newer contracts, you know, they're all in line. I think it's, you know, honestly, it's hard to move the needle on getting your performance up, you know, especially when you're trying to kind of do it after the fact or something's imminent. I think it's more around, you know, getting your story to straight to try to, to, to try to show that you've shut the barn door, um, you know, because otherwise it's like, you know, story A is, yeah, you know, I know there's room to get some more margin, but, you know, we've just been happy with the money that we've been making, but I know our customers pay more. I'm not paying you for that <laughs> at all, <laughs> you know, versus, yep, we had one bad contract. We fired the sales guy <laughs> a year ago, but you know what? We needed to honor the contract, <laughs> fulfill it out. It had a crappy gross profit. It's done in December in all of our new contracts. The bid profit is at four points higher. Hey man, that's a good story, you know, that, that I have that I have um, relative to the first story. Yeah, and I that's would say you no know, by going through this process and, and you know where your material weaknesses are in all of these buckets and just own it. You can't hide it. It'll it'll come out and it'll come out to bite you even worse. And then there's distrust. So, but, but have a solution. You can't give the, uh, the teenage answer of, uh, so um, you have to have kind of, you know, even if you haven't implemented that solution, say, okay, we've been thinking about this. We've been talking about this. We've been working with this, you know, looking for an alternative supplier to essentially shift to those kind of things that may be that the buyer implements but that you've planted the seed and move forward, or at least given them alternatives and recognition of that may be a weakness in the, the, the armor of the company, but that you're not ignoring it and you're being proactive. And, but for the potential transaction that you would continue to implement that and move forward. So that's all you know, have, have, I had a, um, when I was younger and everybody knew this as an associate, if you go ask this person, he was our one of our experts in a particular area of law. You do not go ask him a question without having possible answers. Uh, and if you go in, you ask him, uh, okay, uh, what about this? The response is, what do you think about that, young man? And it's like, okay. And I, I made that mistake once. It's kind of like a joke. It's like, no one tells you that. It's, it's part of your... Uh, 
uh, training, um, maybe hazing. Uh, I shouldn't call it that. that we, there's no hazing in a law firm. Um, but <laughs> it is, okay, so, you know, have potential solutions to known problems, essentially, to be able to share with a prospect. A couple comments that have come in here that are interesting. Uh, one, and I agree with Tim on this, is like, I can't imagine how complex PPP and COVID unemployment benefits could make buying and selling a company right now. Um, you know, I would, before you jump into that, because I would actually like to hear some interesting stories from either one of you guys on how that has kind of thrown additional challenges in or things that, you know, additional complexity. So put that one kind of in your thinking cap, but I'll leave this one uh, anonymous, um, but uh, you know who you are and thank you for <laughs> putting this comment. It's interesting, we've danced with an interested party and over and above the financials were the importance of processes they wanted to see. It improved our company by focusing on all of our processes. So uh, that's, that's a great point. So thank you for that comment. Um, what do you guys think about the whole complexity that PPP and COVID unemployment and all that kind of stuff is thrown into some of these deals in the last two years? Um, you know, it's going to sound kind of underwhelming, but it's, it's kind of been a non-issue in the sense that if you're still, um, like if you if you're flatter up, man, you are super super attractive, <laughs> you know. And even if you were down, but you've rebounded, you're you're pretty darn attractive, you know, to people because there's still you know there's just a lot of money that's still that's still out there, um, floating around. So multiples are still at, at all time highs. I mean, I think, you know, from my perspective, the only negative impact that we saw from COVID related to, um any of this stuff was, you know, literally deals that were in process at March, <laughs> you know, either being put on hold or having 2020, either being put on hold or having um, terms change, you know, to, to get the deal done just because nobody knew it was going to happen outside of that. I mean, anything that happened, you know, probably after the fall of 2020 has kind of looked a lot like a normal deal, you know, frankly, I mean, we've had a couple you know, you got some roadblocks around like, all right, meaning that there, there are logistics issues like, okay, PPP hasn't been forgiven yet. It's still on the books. I've got some extra cash, you know, money's going to have to go in escrow, you know, hey, we've got ERTC money that we're waiting on. How do we keep the company active to be able to receive the ERTC funds? I mean, you got logistic issues to sort out, but in terms of, you know, real, you know, real problems like, uh, throwing a flag on the play. <laughs> you know, we haven't really seen any of those since kind of the spring, summer 2020 timeframe. Outside of that, it's kind of been smooth sailing, you know, for the most part, it's like back on wood. Yeah, I think, I think there's more to come on that with, as we figure out, well, there's kind of two, I think, related parallel thoughts on that. The first is the impact on businesses with respect to liabilities and things that they're do, they've done in the past or haven't done in the past. And how is that going to impact the benefits and et cetera, that they're offering to their employees and the costs, related costs associated to employers for providing those benefits and managing COVID. And we've talked about, okay, mandates, uh, vaccines, masks, uh, people being ordered to work and then getting sick, uh, you know, those kind of things that we've talked about in the past. So managing those kind of things. But then there's the other perspective, and I, I actually probably should have had that as part of my list and talking about goodwill, et cetera, is, is it a friendly workplace? Okay. And so, you know, do, do you, are you providing those benefits? Are you providing um, the, the option to go remote or have some sort of blended mixed environment, which means, okay, how attractive are you for 
obtaining and retaining employees. So me as a, as a prospective buyer, what is going, you know, am I, am I buying into, I want to say a hostile work environment, because that has a specific meaning essentially, or, or an implied meaning that means something different, but you know, is it, is it friendly? Is it someplace where you're going to retain people or is it really just a revolving door? So th those are things that you need to think about that need to be thought about with respect to things like COVID um, on the PPP side of things. Um, I think we're kind of coming towards the, the end of that and the impact on that. Yes, there are impacts with respect to buying and selling of businesses uh, that have received PPP money um, that has not been forgiven yet. Uh, but those numbers are decreasing over the course of time. So those are kind of economic and non-economic impacts of, the, of what was asked about PPP and, and unemployment benefits. Yeah, that's good. Any other questions out there? Man, Robert, uh, you kind of jumped in early. Hopefully we addressed those questions and thoughts for you. Um, and to the other two that have weighed in that will keep anonymous, thank you for your participation. We appreciate that. You guys are pretty regular on here too. We appreciate that. Um, you know, one thing, Gary, that we didn't talk about necessarily was we're talking about transition, but we didn't really say have a transition plan, right? And so, um, and, and, and be flexible. It may be that you don't think that there's anyone that's qualified with inside the family, meaning literally or figuratively. So a family member or a key employee. And so you're looking outward, uh, but you, it may be right there waiting and just, you know, has, has not been kind of looked into. The other is, and the more dangerous one is thinking that, okay, your heir apparent is all in son or daughter or whomever is ready to take over the reins at some point. So uh, you become a little bit academically lazy. So all the things that we've been talking about, it's like, well, I don't have to explain that because he knows, she knows, and he or she's going to deal with it. So you know, don't fall into that trap that I see owners fall into and come to me and say, I don't know, for 10, 12 years, I thought that that's what she wanted to do. And she told me she didn't want to hurt my feelings. So she never told me. So be aware of that and, and just have alternative plans. And, and so what I'm saying is, is be prepared to go down either route uh, in case things aren't exactly as they seem, but I'm encouraging you to go find out and ask those questions so you're not surprised. A couple more questions that, that have come in here that's, that are pretty good. So Tim says, does a high employee turnover rate affect the value of a company? Yes. You know, yeah. I mean, it kind of, it kind of depends. I mean, you know, if it's a McDonald's franchise, you know, maybe not, you know, in terms of like what, in terms of what you would expect to see, but you know, when it's something where you just, you just wouldn't, you know, when it, when it's, when it's kind of a normal rate of turnover that you would expect, it probably doesn't detract much, but it certainly doesn't freaking help relative to, you know, long-term stability with one caveat, you know, that that's going to add to it. But the caveat in terms of long-term stability is that if you're, you know, so what we find happening where it's like, look, actually you having long-term stability is actually a value destroyer, not an enhancer. You know, it, it's the case of, yeah, we don't really have any turnover, you know, everybody's been here forever, but your standards are so freaking low, <laughs> you know, and you're overpaying, you know, your receptionist is making a hundred grand a year because she's been there since 1925. Um, you know, that, 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 how, how is that a value destroyer? It's because your EBITDA is artificially low and, you know, what, you know, and what the, what the buyer always said, well, you know, you're going to have a lot of room for improvement because we know we overpay people, but man, you'll be able to replace it. Well, then you should freaking fire them, man. I don't want to have to fire the, 
90 year old receptionist, <laughs> you know, like you need to take care of that before I get here. So, I mean, I, I literally have had, you know, a client, to, this client is highly logical, not very emotional. I'm like, man, I would have never had the guts to do that. Acquire. He literally walked in and said, Hey, you know, my name's Dave. I'm taking over, you know, really would love to have all you guys, but I got to be honest, you're all overpaid. Um, so I'm going to have to implement a 25% across the board pay cut. Otherwise I can't have you working here. <laughs> you know, and like he kind of knew that he was going to be able to replace him, but I'm like, Oh Lord. <laughs> so that, I don't know if that answered your question, but that that's kind of, um, yeah, that, that kind of gives you a, uh, you know, kind of some parameters around, you know, it depends. And here's where low turnover is actually bad. <laughs> yeah and we, we haven't told a whole lot of war stories but i'm going to tell one quickly so here's a s- scenario dad the patriarch of the family owns 100 percent of the company son is the ceo and has been for a decade or so going in to buy the business there was a high turnover rate and the explanation was well my son's a jackass but he's my baby boy so i can't fire him but oh, wow. when you fire him after you buy it then everything will be great and so to add to the point, it's like, no. And oh, and then I added, I don't, oh, and please, I, I'm, I actually want in the contract that you can't fire him until, you know, 30 days, 60 days post-closing. So, I mean, most bizarre, obviously no way we would agree to that, but it was go have a discussion with your son and however you want to take care of it, but he's no longer going to be employed by the company. But then what that also caused us to do was to, with permission, go talk to the employees and say, all right. You know, what's going on? We see this. This is a confidential discussion, but please tell us what's going on because we want to be able to run the company on day one of our ownership and not have everybody flee. Um, And it was more of, you know, we will be relieved when he is gone kind of thing. So, you know, those things do happen and it, it can affect the value, but this was a way to validate that it was the person and the worst case scenario would have been if we found out, no, it was, it was either that person had poisoned the environment so much that it was toxic and it wouldn't be fixed anytime soon or that, well, yeah, he's part of the problem, but it's really, it's him and everyone else, you know, and, and this person and that person. So anyway, yeah, short it's, little story. It, it's funny too. Cause like, you know, getting back to the emotion of that, Jack, it's like, <sighs> if you, you kind of want to follow the story around, well, did, did dad's relationship with son get any better? Because I mean, okay, you know, got it. You didn't fire him dad, but then Gary did the second he bought the company. (laughs) How's that any different than dad fired him? I mean, you're right, dad, you didn't put the bullet in my head, but sure as hell did hand the guy a load of gun. (laughs) So it's just, you know, it's like one of those red herring, you know, what are you thinking? (laughs) <laughs> you know, get your own house. Just highlights. Get your own house in order first. <laughs> you know, it's funny. You, your example, Adam, was, um, hey, we're all going to have to take twenty five percent pay cut. So you know, I'm paying up. We're over, over over paying for you. Well, that actually happened to me uh, on my first turnaround. The company had a negative value. I mean, we didn't have the money. My partner didn't have the money to go bankrupt. <laughs> so when I came in, we did a Hail Mary, tried to win this big account. We didn't win it. We came in second, didn't pay us anything. So we had to take 25% pay cuts across the board, all of us. Well, guess what? Everybody quit <laughs> except for him and me. Well, we had to rebuild uh, and we did, but that's no fun. Uh, Bruce has a great question in here. Would you uh, incorporate copies of your business plan with the transition plan? How can you make the two compatible and logical? Good question. Um, The, you know, that it's a, assuming that if you want to provide some more clarity, Bruce, that'd be pretty helpful. Um, And so in the sense of like a transition plan, like I sold the company, I now have a transition plan. Would I include copies of my business plan with it? You know, the buyer, a buyer probably would ask for that in diligence. And it's probably not bad information to include. You know, I, I think it, I think probably the most important thing with that is that 
you know, what's a, what's a buyer really going to care about? You know, they're going to care about that you've got kind of a pattern of innovation, you know, demonstrating that you have the ability to go into new markets, kind of understand your cost structure. You've got a pattern of, you know, producing a forecast to be able to hit it, you know, to, to what a business plan helps with is kind of evidentiary material that you have your crap together from a management perspective, you know, that, that, you know, so like, yes, I have a business plan here. It is. Guess what? It's actually realistic. You know, it's five years and we've are, we're two years into it, you know, hit it, you know, hundred percent, hundred ten percent, you know, blew it out, whatever the case may be. Like, it's just, it's like another piece of evidentiary material that demonstrates you have your, you have your act together from a management perspective. <clears throat> now, whether or not the buyer does anything with it after that, you know, hard to say because they probably had their own ideas of what they were going to do with stuff. So it just, it just demonstrates that you've got discipline of hitting, you know, hitting goals, which, it, which is a value, that's a value creator, you know, show management rigor that you actually set goals and you hit them shows management rigor. And that's a way to, way to increase your value. Your spidey sense was right. Good job, Adam. Bruce has given you affirmation that's on target with this question. So um, thank you for that. Also, and we're kind of at the end of the hour here, but um, Casey, thanks for commenting here. I'm nowhere close to selling, but this has been good for me to hear. I know I need to stay in shape should I the need or opportunity to sell arise. So you bet. She said, thank you. And uh, we're happy to be of help. That's why we're doing this. Um, I don't know. Do you guys feel like we should go on one more week on M&A or should we move to something else? If you think there's more stuff there, we'll talk amongst ourselves and, uh, and then we'll figure that out. But uh, you'll get some pre-warning, at least on social media and LinkedIn, et cetera, that uh, what we're going to be moving on next week. And who knows? I'm not anticipating a whole bunch out of Capitol Hill, given the food fights going on on Supreme Court, as like Adam had said, and other things. So um, <clears throat> any thoughts from you guys before we sign off? I think if, if we wanted to cover um, kind of the documentation, uh, you know, the anatomy of an LOI and asset purchase agreement, stock purchase agreement, but I don't know if we need to go that granular, but maybe, uh, you know, spend some of the time talking about that and maybe even um, indemnification provisions and then, you know, how that shifts potentially the purchase price kind of thing. So just some thoughts. Yeah, I, I could see going that way. Yeah, all right. So thumbs up from Adam. That's what we'll do. We'll continue M&A War Stories into next week. And I'm sure we have some stories <laughs> even around those things, especially around early on where you make the assumptions that certain things are not binding, but they are, actually are. I, I've seen that happen more than once because people are in good faith. They've never done it before, like Adam was saying on the front end. So I think that's a good Good idea. And so we'll put this thing up on BGW YouTube uh, channel later on this afternoon. And I'm kind of thinking that this one we may want to even send to our clients. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in this one. So anyway, thank you guys for taking the time and joining us. I hope you have a wonderful weekend ahead and we'll hopefully see you for week 97. All right, we'll see you guys. And and planting the seed for week 100. Got a big event coming up, so got to keep oh, them on the hook. Oh, yeah. We're, we're doing a little due diligence on that tomorrow, I think. Yes. Aren't we, Jeff? Yes, we yeah. are. We That's are. right. <laughs> yep. The, the, some, something about maybe a live show. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, you know. All right. At an undisclosed location. That's right. So, all right, guys. We'll see you.